Well, hello and welcome to Dementia Unplugged. I'm Janine Forrest, and I am thrilled that you are joining me in this webcast on how to support brain health. Before we get started, I want you to hear a message from the president of the Dementia Society of America, Kevin Jamison. Welcome. Please listen to this important message from the Dementia Society of America. All content, including any potential medical information, is provided as an informational resource only and is not to be used or relied on for any diagnostic or treatment process. It should not be used as a substitute for professional diagnosis, care, and treatment. Please consult your health care provider before making any health care decisions or for guidance about a specific medical condition. The opinions expressed and the content shared by Dr. Forrest are not necessarily of the opinions and content of the Dementia Society of America. Thank you. Well, again, a warm welcome to each and every one of you who is taking the time to join me and the Dementia Society of America. So we're going to talk about ways to promote brain health. And if you're looking closely at the first slide, you're going to see a very healthy human brain, an adult brain. Now, depending on what time you're, you're watching this, uh, this may not be something you've expected to see right up front, but normally we don't get a chance to see what's inside our craniums. And the human brain is one of the most complex organs. It's really uh, sort of the new frontier of which a lot of research and energy <clears throat> is now being committed. The human brain, just in terms of background, is about three pounds in weight. It's very spongy to the touch. There are about 86 billion, with a B, brain cells, or what we call neurons. And an important piece or message to take home from this slide is that the human brain is really our command and control center for the entire body not just how we think or feel, but the brain controls all functions, uh, the way we move, the way we control our heart, our bladder, our bowel, and so on. And so when we talk about promoting a healthy brain, it really means how do we promote our, you know, the health of our entire body. A little bit more background in detail on what the brain regulates. The brain really does regulate sensory input from the entire body. So that's what we can touch and smell and taste and feel and hear. So every sensory organ uh, allows input into the brain where it's better understood and um, it's the way we can react and respond to the world. It's important to note that the brain controls our heart, blood pressure, breathing, the way we move, our emotions and feelings, thinking and memory, sleep cycle and hormones. Generally, what we do is we divide the, um, <clears throat> the brain into various lobes, and each one is responsible for the most part for different functions within our body. So for example, the frontal lobe, the one right behind our forehead, is responsible for what we call our executive functioning, our executive thinking, how we plan, how we sequence, how we make sense of the world, and so on. 
there's uh, the midbrain. That's our most primitive brain. That's what was developed first when we were developing in the womb. And that controls heart rate and breathing. And so very, very um, essential primitive uh, functions within our body. So it's important to note that different parts of the brain, different lobes, control different actions. But we're learning uh, over time is that the, the brain really does communicate across all functions. So that there is a high density of neurons uh, that really speak to each other throughout the brain. So I'm going to drill down a little more when we talk about cognitive functions, because this is the part when we talk about sort of promoting a healthy brain is what most people think about. You know, how do I remember a little bit better or learn a little bit better? Or maybe are there's a way to promote decision making and attention. So I'm going to list these uh, learning remembering, speaking, and understanding language, reasoning, problem solving, decision making, and attention. It's amazing when we really start to partition out the nuances of what it means to have healthy brain uh, functions in terms of the, of the word cognitive functions. And so when one no longer is able to utilize or is having difficulty with these functions, it's really then that we really start to appreciate how complex and amazing the brain is. We're not gonna be spending uh, much time talking about dementia uh, today because it really is talking about promoting brain health. But it really, the problem is when someone does develop a problem called dementia, which is much more of a global term, you start to see um, sort of a decline in many of these different functions over time. So what can impair cognitive functioning? This is important to understand because if there are ways that we could not have those types of impairments, certainly that would uphold and promote brain health. So I'm gonna list and, and talk a little bit about each one. Um, poor sleep. And uh, sleep we're learning is, is in an incredible way of healing the body. There are particular hormones that are uh, generated from our brain when we sleep, and it helps to support immune system. Um, infections can impair cognitive functioning. This is a particular red flag when we talk about older adult health. People over the age of 65, 70, typically don't mount much of a fever. And one can um, surmise that there may be an infection because there are changes in mental status. So the infection doesn't always show up first as a fever or changes in blood cells, particularly white blood cells. But what one sees is a change in mental status and we can suspect, hmm, there might be a bladder infection or a pneumonia developing. Medications, particularly if an individual takes five or more medications within the same day, they're at risk for what we call polypharmacy. And it's the drug-drug interactions that can cause problems in cognitive functioning. Alcohol abuse. Uh, the sort of the consistent use of alcohol day to day in, in amounts that are, are certainly not recommended. When there's a lack of oxygen to the brain, and that could be 
anything from, from cardiac arrest, or there may be a narrowing within, let's say, the carotid arteries in our necks, where there is a decreased blood flow, and then therefore a lack of oxygen to the brain can cause a diminished cognitive functioning. Other types of conditions that narrow the inside of our blood vessels can impair cognitive functioning. Think about like a, a garden hose. And if you were to squeeze it or narrow it, there's less flow of water. Same thing happens when someone has a condition known as diabetes or heart disease or smoking, all of those um, factors play into the role of narrowing our blood vessels and therefore narrow uh, the oxygenation to the, to the brain. Other factors you should be aware of include tumors, head trauma, and I'll talk a little bit more about head trauma, but certainly there's much more in the news when we talk about things like concussions uh, from not wearing helmets and in football or um, you know, hockey or boxing. Poor nutrition can certainly diminish um, and, uh, blood flow, can certainly diminish the energy stores to the brain. Dehydration, when we don't have enough fluid or water in our system, that can also um, show up or present as, as, as cognitive, you know, impairment in cognitive functioning, sort of confusion. I talked a little bit about stroke, uh, when there's poor blood flow to different parts of the brain. And then lastly, uh, dementia. Dementia, as I said, is a, a sort of an umbrella term that consists of many, many different types of underlying uh, reasons that impair two or more uh, brain functions over time. And the most common that you're probably familiar with or some of you are things like um, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, frontal temporal dementia. But dementia is just one, one uh, facet of what can impair cognitive functioning. So I hope that gives you a little bit, bit of a background. Um, I'm going to continue talking until uh, about, you know, we fill about a 30 minute slot and then I'm going to open it up for question and answer for which you can use the chat button. Before I talk about promoting brain health, I think it's important to sort of um, articulate what is brain health? What's a, maybe a common definition? And I find one that I particularly think is relevant, and this is for, from the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, it's a little wordy, but I think it captures a lot of, of, of current thinking. So bear with me. The touchstone of brain health is a person's ability to function well in daily life and work. This includes making wise decisions, solving problems, interacting successfully with others, enjoying an emotional balance. All of these functions demand the capacity to remember, comprehend and learn, to process information, events and people, to think strategically and to be innovative in solving problems as they arise. Wow. A rather lengthy definition, but I think it speaks to um, how relevant um, the complexity of, of, of when the brain functions well, it really encompasses many or all of these uh, concepts. It's more than just the absence of disease, is it not? So what are the core elements of brain health of, as, as we understand it today? 
in 2020. What are those core elements of brain health? And <clears throat> the reason I say that as of today, because there really is ongoing research into this sort of new frontier. So maybe in five years, or not even maybe, I would imagine in five years, uh, this information will be updated. So I'm gonna list the core elements and then I'm gonna speak a little bit more in detail. Physical exercise, nutrition, stress management, heart health, adequate sleep, cognitive stimulation, social engagement, and avoiding head injury. That's quite a lengthy list. Um, I would imagine some of us were hoping it was just one thing to make it kind of quick and easy. Uh, but unfortunately, that really doesn't exist. And so it takes all of these, not just one, in order to promote brain health. Let's start with the first one. Move or exercise. What does that mean? We all know by now that it's important to exercise, but what does the research really teach us? From National Institute of Health, I kind of like this slide that makes it uh, rather easy to understand. So how much activity do I need? <clears throat> well, basically, uh, what we're learning is that an individual needs about 150 minutes of sort of aerobic, moderate, intense aerobic activity per week. And some people divide that into 30 minutes, five days a week. It currently could be broken up differently but 150 minutes of aerobic activity and, and a little bit of muscle strengthening. Uh, that could be using your own body weight uh, to do exercises. So this is non-aerobic or doing some weight lifting. So the combination of the two, we need sort of the stress against gravity in order to promote bone health. Uh, I'm going to go back for a minute. Um, what does it mean to have moderate uh, intensity aerobic uh, exercise? Well, what that means is that you are able to still uh, maybe talk uh, while you're doing the activity, um, but there's certainly some exertion. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to run a marathon, but just get the heart rate up enough so that there's some difficulty in, in talking perhaps if you have a partner. The other essential core element that we're learning about is diet. And what does that mean? There are certainly all sorts of diets that are promoted and there seems to be something new almost monthly that comes out. But throughout the literature and throughout research, perhaps over the last 10 to 12 years, has been uh, a consistent messaging about what we call the Mediterranean diet. Uh, that's uh, certainly the region where that was developed. But with the Mediterranean diet, it primarily consists of daily, you know, uh, con uh, consumed vegetables, whole grains, healthy fats, and fruits. That's the majority of the plate. Weekly, one can consume fish, beans, eggs, some poultry, moderate portions of dairy products such as eggs, uh, not eggs, uh, uh, 
yogurt, milk. And then lastly, you want to limit your red meat intake to perhaps once a month. Now, um, I can almost see some of the jaws dropping here or the eyes rolling. But in fact, uh, limiting red meat seems to be a cornerstone of the Mediterranean diet. Now, there are other elements to it, such as nuts, a glass of red wine daily. Um, and I mean one glass, more is not better. This is also combined with sort of a social element, you know, being with other people. So it's all interrelated. It doesn't mean eating your Mediterranean diet in front of the television all by yourself. Uh, it's more to it than just eating the right amount of salads. All right, so we have movement, we have nutrition, and now stress management. How do we enhance our mental health? Well, there's a variety of ways. Certainly breathing exercises in through your mouth or in through your nose and out through your mouth. Maybe do that four times. Deep breath in, exhale. Deep breath in. Exhale. The physiology behind that is that it helps to um, decrease the stores of excess cortisol in our system. And so cleansing breaths are incredibly important. Some people actually put them on their timers, on their phones or their watches. Others use sort of a visualization every time you hear a bell ring. Uh, when I'm sitting at a traffic light, that's when I start to do my deep breathing exercises and then certainly other uh, situations, but that's my cue. Instead of you know, worrying patiently about when the light is gonna change. Other ways to promote mental health and improve stress management are through journals, uh, gratitude journals. Write down three things that you're grateful for every day or night, or if that's stressful for you, certainly just articulate that out loud. I mentioned exercise again because exercise has been proven to decrease stress. It gets the blood moving oxidates the entire body, not just the brain. Meditation may come in the form of mindfulness or other practices. Surrounding yourself in nature. Take a walk, you know, out in the park. If you're fortunate to be near water, out in the mountains, even just watching a, a sort of a birds outside if you have a bird feeder. Surround yourself in nature. And certainly not least at all that talk therapy uh, is uh, a wonderful component if necessary to help you manage your stress. I have a, a picture on the screen with a heart holding hands with a brain and I love that image because the adage is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So that means maintaining a healthy weight, managing your know, hypertension or high blood pressure, if that is, is um, part of your you know, uh, experience, part of maybe your health underlying conditions. Prevent high cholesterol and certainly the Mediterranean diet is one way to do that and preventing diabetes. So a takeaway from this is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. A little bit more about sleep and how much is necessary. According to the CDC guidelines, that's the Center for Disease Control, adults 18 and older need about seven hours or more per night. Uh, 
and it sort of breaks it down on this slide a little bit more. Um, uh, 18 to 60 years, seven or more hours, 61 to 64, interestingly, seven to nine hours, 65 years and older, seven to eight hours. It might seem a little bit nuanced, but I think the general idea is one should not be chronically sleep deprived and receive a minimum of seven hours per night, because that really does help to rejuvenate the brain. Cognitive stimulation, or what I like to call lifelong learning. And this is much more than just learning, you know, how to do crossword puzzles over and over again. Actually, the research um, doesn't support uh, doing the same thing over and over again. That doesn't create uh, what we call neuroplasticity or promote it. It's really the learning of or teaching of something new. And that could be something in the arts, learning how to, uh, to mold, to sculpt, to do pottery, to play an instrument, learning to play bridge, something that stimulates your brain. What I do want to convey is that sitting behind the television or sitting behind your screen on your phone for hours on end does not, does not promote brain stimulation or lifelong learning. It's a very passive kind of activity. So just in terms of self-awareness, pay attention to how much hours in terms of screen time you put in per day and begin to think about other ways that could stimulate your mind, learn something new, and promote your brain health. One of the other major components of brain health is being socially engaged, being connected. Loneliness can certainly play a role in terms of of, of depression and other problems uh, with cognitive decline. So connect with your friends whenever possible. That could be informally, that could be through other avenues uh, such as faith-based communities, volunteering, whatever it takes uh, to be socially engaged. And lastly, avoiding head injury. Now, uh, many of us aren't pro athletes or football players, but if we go bike riding, wear your helmet. If you go driving, wear a seatbelt. Look for potential um, objects along the way in our own homes that might be a, put us at risk for falling. Uh, that may be just throw rugs or look for uh, electrical cords. Uh, so fall risk, head injury can be a real problem and that can create sort of a cascade of trauma to the brain and uh, multiple traumas to the brain. Our risk factor for even, um, uh, for even some types of dementias. So the general message here is do our best, do your best, do my best to avoid head injury. Well, I hope that gives you a flavor of what it means to promote brain health. And in the meantime, uh, from the Dementia Society of America and all, all the researchers who are looking uh, for cures, um, the Dementia Society of America is promoting ways to learn how to care uh, for people with different uh, brain problems and particularly the dementias. And I put down cures because I don't believe it's going to be one magic um, sort of answer to any of this. There, it's so multimodal, uh, so many factors involved. 
that I think it will be many ways to cure these problems. I would like to tell you that if any of you would like to have a one-to-one -one consultation with me uh, through my own um, service, private practice called Through the Forest, please feel free uh, to contact me through Dementia Coach on Call. That's the service that I provide. It is an online consultation service. Uh, that's DementiaCoachOnCall.com or call me at 773-704-1834. I do want to thank the Dementia Society of America for hosting uh, this webinar. Please uh, take a moment to take a look at this wonderful, wonderful resource and website. And if so inclined, I would encourage you to make a donation uh, to continue this important work. So on the next slide, I am going to stop the recording in order to allow more privacy for the question and answer time. But I do want to thank all of you um, at this point uh, for joining Dementia Unplugged.